Thank you. All right. And then just on the topic, we went through the colon, and now that we've seen it with the endoscope, the question that I like to ask fellows and everybody in the room is, uh, if you know it, please say I have Southwest drink tickets if you win the prize. Um, <laughs> on colonoscopy, what are the only two locations where we know with 100% certainty of where we are? Cecum. Cecum. Well, I'm, I'm actually going to say Transfer. maybe not the cecum. Transverse colon. On colonoscopy. The ileum, the terminal ileum in the rectum. The reason is there's a lot of false cecums out there, as we know it flexures. So on colonoscopy, not limited to the colon, right? Where do you know with 100% certainty? The rectum, because you put it right in, and the small bowel, this is my talk, um, the ileocecal valve going through there into the terminal ileum because it looks different. You see the villi. So on endoscopy, those are the two locations, okay? So let's move on. We'll try to keep this exciting for you. Um, we have the digestive tract here. We're going to jump right in. Um, this is celiac disease, celiac sprue. Um, so we've heard a lot about celiac gluten-sensitive enteropathy is another um, name for it. It's an autoimmune disease of the small intestine, meaning that your gut doesn't recognize sort of itself. And something that it's exposed to, in this particular case, gluten, is what triggers it. And it triggers the inflammation and the damage to the small bowel inappropriately. We don't really know why the disease exists. It's probably a combination of some degree of genetics as well as the environment and lifetime there. The genetic predisposition, so there's some haplotypes. You might have heard of HLA DQ2 or DQ8. Um, basically, around 25 to 30% of the population has those, but not everybody who has that then develops celiac disease. Only about 3% in that regard do. And so it's probably that combination where you're susceptible to it, and then you get the insult from the environment or the diet. And so what is gluten exactly? Well, gluten is a protein. It's found in wheat, rye, and barley. So basically all the stuff that I really love eating is, would be gluten positive there. Um, and it's sort of that thing that gives donuts their doughiness and everything else. Um, but it can be found in other things as other than just food products. And so some of those things are in cosmetics um, and skin products, even some detergents. And so when we have patients that come in who, you know, are really just saying, I'm having a hard time, I really avoid gluten as best I can, there's a spectrum of sensitivity that's involved there. And so they might be unintentionally exposing themselves to gluten through one of these other non-oral uh, mechanisms. And so we have to think, how sensitive are they? What are they doing unintentionally? Certainly, the spectrum goes from asymptomatic individuals all the way along to malabsorption and growth failure. And we'll get into why that is when I show you what the small bowel can look like. So we have blood tests for celiac. And so how we do this is typically um, one of these three. The one that has the highest sensitivity and specificity, meaning if it's positive, you probably have it. If it's negative, you probably don't, is the tissue transglutaminase. And it's based on an IgA blood test there. Well, we know that part of the population doesn't sort of make IgA. They're IgA deficient, around 10%. And so really, when you test this, you also have to check their IgA level to make sure that they're not falsely negative because they don't have the IgA. And then you have the other tests here as well, which are very good, but some have better specificities and sensitivities. And then certainly the gold standard is going down and doing endoscopy because really what you're looking at is taking biopsies. And so this is where those multiple biopsies come from. So in endoscopy, when we're looking for a diagnosis of celiac disease, we try to biopsy at least four biopsies in the second portion of the duodenum, and at least two in the duodenal bulb for a total of six biopsies. And some of the features that you'll see on endoscopy is some reduced folds. So instead of them being big and sort of line like you could see, they're sort of flat here. Scalloping, you're going to look at the ridge here, and you can sort of see it forms like scallops. And then over here, you can just see it's very nodular in appearance. And so that's sort of the classic endoscopic appearance of celiac disease. 
And so what is the treatment for it? Well, it's strict gluten avoidance. There's no pill that people can take. This is where pharma could help, because um, I'm sure a lot of people would like to eat their apple fritters. Those are my favorites. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> pharma could certainly help. But it's for right now, it's strict avoidance of gluten. Um, Moving on to obscure gastrointestinal bleeding. So what is this? So we've talked about gastrointestinal tract bleeding, but what does it mean to be obscure? So it basically means that we as endoscopists just cannot find the cause with standard upper endoscopy or colonoscopy. And sometimes that takes multiple upper endoscopies and colonoscopies, and we just don't have the reason for why this patient is bleeding. And that's about 10% of all gastrointestinal bleeding. Now then we can break that down and say, all right, well, we know the person's bleeding, but we can't find it. So is it occult, meaning you can, can't see it? You look at the stool and it looks brown. Maybe you could test for it, it's microscopic. Or is it overt? You're like, oh wow, that stool is red, or it's black, or it has some clots and maroon, but you just can't find that cause. And so when we look at that 10% that we can't find on the standard upper or lower endoscopy, we find that about 75% out of that population is actually the causes located in the small bowel, and 25% was located not in the small bowel. So we probably should have been able to see it, hopefully with an upper or lower endoscopy, but just were unable to. There's a variety of lesions that can do that. The, some of the more frustrating ones can be angioectasias, which are blood vessel malformations that bleed, or um, diulophoy lesions, which are little submucosal arteries that sort of pop up, bleed, and when the pressure comes down, they drop under the surface. And so you have to kind of be at the right place at the right time to see those. And so looking here further, what are these causes, as I mentioned? So certainly if you're looking in the small bowel, you can have ulcers and Crohn's disease. And we'll hear more about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but Crohn's disease can affect anywhere along the gastrointestinal tract, from the mouth all the way through to the anus. And so you should be suspicious. Maybe they have some ulcers in their small bowel. Or is there an ulcer from like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication that could be present in the small bowel? They just don't have to affect the stomach. Um, and when I go through non-steroidals with my patients and I ask about them, I actually don't say, are you on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications? Um, I have to go through all of them. BC, goody powder. How many people know what BC and goody powder are? You guys from the South? Yeah, so for, for, for everyone who's not, so um, we all know Motrin, Aleve, Advil, Naproxen. But then um, there's this other two big ones, Goody Powder and BC, which are really potent non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications that's really only in the southeast U.S. I couldn't tell you why, but if you ever come down, I'm in Nashville now, but when I trained up in Boston, I had no idea what these were until my first week when I was on call. And I went through my list for non-steroidals, and I said, hey, this is, you know, these are all them. And the patient's like, no. And one of my fellows who grew up in the South said, are you taking BC powder? No. And the person's like, yeah. And I'm like, what is that? So, so just know that they come in all varieties there. Um, a diulophoy lesion, so this actually is a good picture um, of what they look like when they bleed. Remember, it's arterial blood. So they squirt and then they stop real quick. These are angioectasias down here. And you can see it's basically malalignments. You can think of it where it's just weak blood vessels. They don't have that muscle um, that most vessels do. And so they bleed uh, surreptitiously. And you can have multiple of them along the entire tract. We have Meckel's diverticulum, which is an outpouching in the small intestine, two feet from the ileocecal valve. The reason why they bleed is they contain some gastric tissue, and so they can get ulcers in there just like you would in your stomach and bleed from that end. And then you can have tumors of the small bowel. And so what do we do to evaluate that? Well, we repeat the upper and lower endoscopy. Sometimes you might hear of a push uh, enteroscopy, that's basically where instead of just going to sort of the second portion of the duodenum, you really try to advance that standard upper endoscope, or maybe you use a pediatric colonoscope to go as far down into the small bowel as you can. And usually you can make it to the proximal jejunum, so around the ligament of trites, just into that first part there. And then colonoscopy. There's capsule endoscopy. So what is capsule? So capsule is essentially a little pill. It has a battery, and it has a camera in it. And basically, you have your patient swallow it down, and it transmits that video footage to a recorder. 
that recorder then gets the information downloaded and a physician or um, a mid-level provider will watch that video to see if there's any pathology, lesions that could bleed, any reason for that. And so in this, this is actually footage from um, a capsule. And what it is, you'll see some ulcers uh, as we go by here. And those, this is a patient who has Crohn's disease. Um, what's nice about this is that you can see the gastrointestinal tract. It's pretty minimally invasive, meaning we don't have to sedate people for it. But some downsides are the capsule moves passively, so you can't control it in this day and age in a commercial fashion to say, hey, look here and spin it so it sort of just tumbles through based on peristalsis and gravity. And you can't do therapy with it, so it's purely diagnostic. So when you see something, you sort of figure out where it might be along these 20 to 25 feet of small bowel so that you can figure out how to go and, and get it. Um, so what are some of these things that look like on capsule? So active bleeding is going to appear red, as you can see up in that top corner there. A small bowel tumor is going to look sort of like a basketball, like a bulge that comes out there. And these changes can be pretty subtle as well. Angiovectasia, which we saw earlier there. And then you can see these tiny little ulcers right there. And so as I said, the disadvantages are usually they only examine the small intestine. However, there are capsules now that examine the colon. The indication currently in the U.S. for the colon capsule is a failed colonoscopy, not because of bowel preparation or anything else. Um, you can't take biopsies, so meaning these are pure diagnostic modalities, not therapeutic. And the reading times can be very long. Um, the footage generally can range approximately seven hours in length. And so what you can do is you can read them faster than that. You can speed it up to certain frame lengths, but it still takes an extended amount of time to really sit and go through it. And then there is a small risk of retention of the capsule. And you see that in particular in patients who have had inflammatory bowel disease, so like Crohn's disease where you can get narrowings or strictures or in people who have had prior surgeries. And so a lot of times if you are at risk for having a narrowing of your small bowel, we'll get an image in advance. So either an enterography like a CT or an MRI of the small bowel or a small bowel follow through just to sort of lower that risk. Now I have had a couple cases if you work really closely with your surgeons on patients who come in with let's say recurrent obstructions or suspicion of a stricture there, where we intentionally give them a capsule to get it stuck and when it gets stuck, then the surgeon knows the exact location to go in and sort of take that area out. Again, it's very rare, um, and you have to have a really good close relationship with not only the patient, but also your surgeon to do that. So sometimes while it can be a disadvantage, it can also be an advantage. Um, so we're moving through the evaluation. Then there's deep enteroscopy, or what's called device-assisted. And so this is going beyond what we can get with sort of the standard therapies. And so there's two branches of this. One is balloon-assisted, and the other is tube-assisted or over-tube-assisted. And so balloons, you can either have two balloons or you can have one balloon. And essentially what you're doing is you're going through that small bowel and then you're pleating it back on either the over-tube or the endoscope, and I'll show you that in a second. And you can think about it like when you're trying to put a shower curtain over the rod and you keep sort of pushing it back and it gets bunched up. That's exactly what you're doing here. And then you have rotational enteroscopy, which is an over-tube that has spirals down it. And so simply by twisting the over-tube in a rotation, you get it to pleat up on the bowel, right? So it grabs onto the bowel and pulls it back so you can advance the endoscope. Now, obviously, patients are sedated for these. We typically use, um, you know, monitored anesthesia care or propofol in these cases. And CO2, now that it's come out for insufflation, is really essential in these. And so, um, again, we talked about pleating. But really, you can go from either direction to evaluate the entire small bowel. So when you hear antegrade, that means we're going through the mouth in the direction that food would go. And when we talk about doing them retrograde, we go through the rectum to get into the small bowel. And you're going to say, well, how do you choose this? And really, the choice is based on that capsule endoscopy in advance and looking at sort of, do I have a better shot of getting at this lesion from going from the top?
or do I have a better shot at getting this lesion from going from the bottom? Um, in some, depending on how persistent you are in your patient, you can actually evaluate all 25 feet with these. Now, you have to switch usually between them, and so what you'll do is you'll go down as far as you can, and a lot of people will place a marker or a tattoo because you can do therapy, and then come back up the other way and see your tattoo, and you'll know you've covered the whole distance. Now, diagnostic, we can talk about yields of this, but really, in some cases, you might see something like a small angioectasia, and you could treat it, but that might have not been sort of the bleeding lesion because you could have multiple of them. So the diagnostic yield, while it's reported to be 70 plus percent, the therapeutic yield or the clinical yield in, in my sort of experience or practice is much lower. Um, so what does it look like? So we're, this is a double balloon, and so the blue is actually the over tube, and the green area is the balloon on the front of the enteroscope, and these are much longer than our standard endoscopes. These are 200 centimeter scopes, so you need special long tools uh, to go with them. And so the endoscope gets advanced through the small bowel, and then the balloon at the end is inflated. And so then the balloon on the over tube, which is the blue-purple balloon, gets deflated, and the over tube is advanced over the endoscope. And then that balloon is inflated, so now you have two balloons, and basically they anchor in the small bowel, and then they're reduced or pulled back. And so you can see that you're getting pleating then of that bowel. And then you deflate the first balloon that's on the endoscope, and you advance that endoscope forward and repeat. And so you continuously prep there. This is rotational endoscopy, and so essentially it's the same thing. The over tube has spirals on it. You go into the small bowel, and as you twist the endoscope, it pleats back that bowel and drives you forward. So while part of it is you're bringing that endoscope forward, the other part is actually you're just bringing bowel back in front of you and controlling the tip to move. The nice part about these is they're not only diagnostic, but you can also do therapy with them. And so here, here's a nice radiograph, actually, of what an enteroscope looks like deep in the small bowel. You can see just how wound it is. And then you can pass different instruments. So if we have an angioectasia, this is actually a thermal bicap probe that you can put pressure on and cook the angioectasia to achieve hemostasis. Or you can do biopsies, let's say, if you find like a tumor in there. So after that's said there, the other options are radiologic. And so you might have heard of the tagged red blood cell scan. People might say, send them for a tagged RBC. And so what this is, is this is a way to detect bleeding. You have to be actively bleeding to have this sort of be positive. And the rate of bleeding that this can detect is down to 0.1 mLs per minute. And so what happens is the patient comes in. They take about 20 cc's of your blood. They mix it with a radio label, technetium-99, and then it gets re-injected back into your body. And then you go under your Geiger counter, and you see if there's any areas that are outside of vessels where there is blood. And that would indicate that you're bleeding. Now, so these are sort of the positive and negative, but it's really, they're really hard to say, oh, yeah, you're bleeding from you know, the duodenum, or you're bleeding from your stomach. They sort of give you a general appearance and area. So there's angiography, which is exactly what it sounds. So a radiologist will put a catheter into a major blood vessel, inject dye, and see where that dye extravasates or comes out. And in this particular case, it's coming out there. So you see the blood. You have to be bleeding at a little bit of a quicker rate than for a tagged RBC scan. It's 0.5 mLs per minute, or 0.4 in some institutions, mLs a minute. And then what you can do, the nice part of angiography, is you can actually put therapy or a coil or a clip there through your angiocatheter or inject a sclerosin agent to get hemostasis or get bleeding to stop. And so really the treatment for these bleedings depends on the severity of it and where the location is. And so it goes back to the same principles. You want to make sure they have transfusions if they need it. You want to try to achieve hemostasis endoscopically. And certainly, if you can get it to stop with either endoscopic therapy or radiologic assistance, that's great. And as a last resort, there's always surgery. But really, you have to try and find where that lesion is. 
because you can't say to a surgeon, well, just take out from the bottom part of the esophagus to the you know, transverse colon and connect them together. Um, small bowel obstruction. We've talked a little bit about bowel obstructions uh, from the top there, but these are pretty similar. So it can be mechanical or functional, and it basically is an impediment to the normal transit of food, liquids, and nutrients there. And this is an emergency. And the reason why this is an emergency is because you can get infarction, meaning your bowel could get thicker, inflamed, and then perforate. And so symptoms of this are abdominal pain, distension, right, because we're always sucking in air and fluid to go through. And if you have an obstruction, meaning nothing's going through, you're going to get distended. And that leads to nausea, vomiting, and sometimes constipation, right, because you're basically making your circuit not in continuity. And so what is some of the causes? So there's adhesions, and these form typically after people have surgeries, whatever that is, whether you've had you know, your gallbladder out years ago or an appendectomy or even a cesarean section. And so sometimes surgeons would have to go in and do what's called lysis of adhesions and, and cut these. You can get hernias. So these are typically ventral wall hernias. Sometimes they can be hernias elsewhere. But all it is is it's a protrusion of bowel through, let's say, an orifice or an opening. And then the bowel can get trapped inside there, meaning it doesn't get reduced. And so you can get items stuck or obstruction. Small bowel tumors are possible. We saw them. This is an endoscopic picture. We saw them on our capsule photos. And then this is taken out from the operating room. You can get into susception. So this is basically where you have your bowel that gets accordioned on itself. And so if you see an intussusception radiologically, it looks like a target or an O there because you're looking at it on face usually from the front. But you should think in the back of your head, at least we do as gastroenterologists, why did it intussuscept? And usually it's because there's a leading edge or some anchor point or a tether. And so you should be really concerned about a tumor or a large polyp or something if you see an intussusception. Be aggressive about trying to figure out why. Strictures, so these can be from those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. They can also be from radiation, if people have radiation for other cancers or malignancies there. And certainly what Vivek did not talk about is the bezoar, and I have a picture of actually the bezoar inside yes. of the, yeah, it's nice, inside of the small bowel. And so bezoars are essentially either plant material, so a phytobezoar or trichobezoars, which are hair, that can be ingested. So you can think of it like your drain at home, you know, in the shower, it's sort of running slow. That's a trichobezoar of your drain. So this can happen as well um, in people. <laughs> yes, don't go home and think that that's what you have. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the classic yeah, medical school. <laughs> But it's good. <laughs> um, and then, so how do you diagnose it? So this is a classic x-ray. So if you see or somebody says air fluid levels, this is what we're talking about. So air on x-ray is going to be black. And so you can see all these black things. And then you see how nice there's like this pristine line that goes across there. That's just, you can imagine just water hanging there. And so that's what an air fluid level looks like on an x-ray. And this would indicate obstruction, right? So it's not going through. So you're going to develop those. Certainly CT scans are also good at it because then you can actually pinpoint the location. And so we've highlighted in yellow here where you can see it sort of whoop, narrows down in this area from dilated loops of bowel to really just small. And that's where your stricture, your transition point is. So what do you do? Decompression. So suck out water and fluid from the top, right? You don't want to keep putting more stuff down. Low intermittent suction is typically what we recommend. And you want to collect, co correct their electrolytes. So you're going to replete your magnesium, your phosphorus, your potassium. Make sure you give them the fighting chance to get the gut going again and let the muscle sort of take over. And really give them IV fluids because they're losing a lot of fluid insensibly as well, especially if you're sucking out even normal gastric contents and juice through your nasogastric tube. And then it's surgery, going and either resecting that segment as a bowel or doing an enterotomy, which is basically cutting the tissue along its face and then suturing it 
in the other direction. And the reason for that is you expand the lumen. So rather than cutting and then sewing sort of up and down, you're sewing it across horizontally. And that way you can actually expand that part of the bowel. We have mesenteric ischemia. So that's where you get inflammation or injury of your small intestine because you've cut off the blood supply to some degree or in its entirety. Um, and so what is the major blood supply to the GI tract? And in particular, the small and large bowel comes off the aorta. There's the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric artery, or the SMA, and the inferior mesenteric artery, the IMA. And so the celiac generally gives you your stomach all the way through, usually until about where the papillary ampulla is. The superior mesenteric artery goes from that point all the way down to about two-thirds of the way across the transverse colon. And then your inferior mesenteric artery goes from about the two-third point down. And so if you have acute mesenteric ischemia, it's usually from a blood clot or an embolism, right? So it happens, boom, right away. And the presentation is somebody has severe abdominal discomfort. They just look terrible, right? Because you've acutely cut off their blood supply to their gastrointestinal tract. And so on physical exam, they're going to come in and say, they are feeling so bad, they are the worst, and you could push on their belly, and you're like, your belly's fine. And that's what's called, if you've heard, pain out of proportion to exam. And so given this clinical scenario, you should be really suspicious of acute mesenteric ischemia. And then you have chronic, which is basically slow narrowing of these vessels, either from arthrosclerotic plaques or other causes of stenosis. Those people present usually with discomfort that gets worse when they eat, right? Because what happens? Why do we get sleepy after we eat? Because the gut's like, hey, give me the blood. And it goes away from your brain because it's working to digest. So the same thing. If you have food and you want all this blood in your gut, but it can't get there, you're going to be really uncomfortable. And so these people lose weight because they don't want to eat anymore. And so they have this fear of eating and weight loss and pain. And so you should start to think of maybe they have chronic mesenteric ischemia. And so acute, what does it look like? So this is a blockage of uh, the SMA by a blood clot, and it basically makes it dusky. And here's what the dusky bowel looks like in the surgical setting. You could see nice healthy is pink, and the dusky one that's lost its blood supply is purple, and that can perforate and necrose. Chronic mesenteric ischemia, in order to get that, it, sometimes one could go down slowly over time, but usually you need more than one of your major vessels because we have collaterals and redundant flow in a lot of areas there before you get these symptoms. But usually um, you'll recognize these patients if they have some other risk factors as well for um, arterial disease, right? Just because somebody has coronary artery disease doesn't necessarily mean that it's just in the heart. The gut can be affected as well as other blood vessels throughout the body by narrowings. And so diagnosis, you can do an angiogram like we talked about before. More commonly, we do radiologic imaging of angiograms. So that's where you hear things like MR angiograms, MR angiography or CT angiography. This is actually a CT um, here, and you can see a big clot in the SMA. And then you can do Doppler as well, which is ultrasound, looking at the flow patterns. Again, here's angiography with the balloon trying to take out that clot with either a, a thrombolytic agent or trying to break that up, or you have surgery to remove that clot, a vascular process, and you can either do graphing and, and rerouting. And with that, I think that's the last slide, so I want to thank you for your attention.